anything else? Okay. Um, I have a proposed resolution, uh, but that resolution is really going to depend upon what the chief has to tell you. So he has a report that he wants to give, and you'll consider it, and then I'll read uh, a resolution for you to consider, and then you can decide exactly what you want to do about it. Go ahead, Chief. In response to the spoil request, please be advised we're still in the process of reviewing 253 cases to see if there are any cases that can be released. If we do find any that fit his original oil request, we will forward them to Mr. Stockler. But we believe the specific case that Mr. Stockler is looking for is a current, ongoing, complicated, multifaceted, and multi-jurisdictional investigation. There are still subpoenas we are waiting for the return of to continue our investigation. Additionally, there are other jurisdictions that are relying on information from our investigation to assist them in charging and prosecuting criminal charges in their jurisdiction. The release of our reports to Mr. Stockler on this specific case will reveal confidential information, invade the personal privacy of victims, reveal non-routine investigative techniques, interfere with a lawful enforcement investigation, and most importantly, <coughs> interfere with the judicial proceeding and prosecution of those to be charged. I am extremely proud and impressed the way, with the way my officers conducted themselves <clears throat> and the work they completed on this investigation. I would love to be able to bring public attention and to praise these officers for the difficult and hard work that they did in this investigation. But this is not the time. If this information is released now, it could destroy their hard work and ruin a very important case that still needs <clears throat> to be completed and prosecuted. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, sir. So I have and will give each of you a copy of the Chief's report. getting is a copy of the chief's uh, review and <coughs> when you were reviewing these documents was that separate from the review that was done initially by your foil officer correct okay. i didn't receive it on my desk till the appeals came in okay thank you so this is a draft of a resolution um i will read it to you um, slowly and you can change it in substance any way you want uh, whereas Asher Stockler presented a FOIL request to the Town of Poughkeepsie Police Department for, open quotes, all police reports for stolen or missing cash or of defrauding an elderly individual of cash made within the last three months, a copy of which is annexed at Exhibit A. And whereas Mr. Stockler has appealed the police department's denial of this FOIL request, copies of the denial and the appeal being also annexed at Exhibit A here too. And whereas the town board of the town of Poughkeepsie having on September 13, 2013, at a special meeting of the town board, been then advised by police chief Cavalier regarding his review of certain materials relevant to the request at exhibit A, which review was independent of the police department's FOIL officers review and whereas the chief has submitted a report which is dated September 13, 2013. 23. And, pardon me, 2000, 2023. Uh, and whereas the chief advises that a search is ongoing for other responsive and non-exempt materials. Now there, therefore, be it resolved uh, that because the documents referred to by the chief were created for law enforcement purposes and also because they include interagency and intra-agency FOIL exempt materials 
that the public disclosure at this time of any substantive portion of them, including those which might identify the involved agencies, would interfere with law enforcement investigations, judicial proceedings, and or potential prosecutions. And for these reasons, Mr. Stockler's FOIL appeal being the same is hereby denied as to the certain specific documents referred to above by the chief. And the legal department shall transmit a copy of this resolution to Mr. Stockler and to the New York State Committee on Open Government. And the police department will make available to Mr. Stockler any non-exempt and responsive documents if and when they are located. Second. Anybody got any other questions on this? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Who moved that? I did. Mike. Okay. Mike. And who seconded? Pardon me. Second. Jeff. Pardon me. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. That brings us to the end of our special town board meeting. Uh, going to committee hall presentation by Ready Coffee. myself. I'm Jed Bonham. I'm the uh, founder of, of Ready Coffee. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to uh, address this board. Um, I am here um, at the invitation of uh, Ann Shershen, uh, whose ward our proposed development falls into. Um, the, the development that I'm going to describe, or the proposed development that I'm going to describe tonight, requires board approval under an existing overlay designation in the ATC. Uh, it would additionally require relief from one of the area requirements of this overlay. So I just wanted to let everyone know up front what we're talking about and why I'm addressing this board instead of, let's say, the planning board or the planning department. Um, I first wanted to give you a quick overview of Ready Coffee. I don't know if, uh, if you all are familiar with the company. We are a locally based company. Um, our headquarters are in Wappingers on Route 376. That is where um, all of our executive staff uh, work. That is where we train. That is where we roast coffee. And that is the center of our operation. Um, we have three um, locations currently we have one on Route 9 that was uh, received planning board approval in this very room uh, several years ago um, we have served over 1.1 million uh, customers through that Route 9 location since it opened uh, and I'd like to thank the town for allowing us to proceed with that location we think it's been a great addition to the community we have a location in Newburgh which opened in 2021 and now a location in LaGrange, which is actually the closest lo location to this, uh, this town hall. Um, and if you have not been there to see it, we would encourage you to do so. We think we made a really wonderful and uh, community enhancing renovation of the old Tompkins Bank. Um, we have development locations in Hyde Park. We were recently approved by the planning board there for an infill location, much like the one we'll talk about tonight. Um, and we're in the process in Middletown, New York currently. Um, we have, ever since we have applied for it, we have won Hudson Valley Magazine's Best of the Hudson Valley Award, so in 2021, 22, and 23. Uh, and and these, uh, these awards are given out by the readers. So there's, there's a readership vote and we have won it each year we have applied. Um, I won't go through all of the reviews that we received, but, uh, and if any of you are familiar with our business, I think 
it's fair to say the business has been very well received here in the Hudson Valley. Um, we are, I think, one of the most highly rated businesses in all of the East Coast. We, we receive extraordinary reviews and ratings from our customers on public platforms. Um, quick look at our menu. And just something to think about as, as I go through this tonight, Ready Coffee, the way we see Ready Coffee um, is that Ready Coffee is a place where the community can come together in person and is a point of physical experience and human connection. If you're a customer of ours, I think you would agree with that. Uh, that's just something I want you to keep in mind as we go through this. Um, so we, you know, as part of our original business plan, we wanted to make nice places better. Um, and that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. These are pictures of, of what our sites look like before we developed them. In Newburgh, upper left, Route 9, lower right. It's hard to remember what these looked like. Um, but they were sites that, in, in good areas, where people wanted something, wanted something with some energy, wanted something new, and there was an opportunity to redevelop um, some sites that were not well used, um, where there was an opportunity to do essentially infill development in all of these. Um, so this is what's there today. Um, it's a it's a business that is loved by our customers. Um, it is a business that has very happy employees and is, I believe, uh, has been a big asset to this community. And that was definitely something that was part of our plan from the start. So this is what we're here to talk about. So the corner of, of um, Maine and Fairmont in the ATC. I think many of you are familiar with this corner. It has been vacant uh, for 75 years. Um, the landlord during our discussions about this parcel has said they have never in this, it, it's been continuously owned by a single owner. They have said they have never found a viable use for this corner. And, and that's not without trying. Um, after looking at the parcel and assessing the economics of it, I agree. It's not something that is that you can use that has an economic feasibility beyond, I think, what we are proposing. Um, and so it, it, it has sit, sat vacant for, for 75 years. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, I did not apply any filter to this photo. It's, it doesn't look very good. It's an unused site. People store their vehicles there when they go out of town. Um, there are other things stored there um, that the landlord has to clear away because it's just left there. It is an unkempt, unkept uh, parcel. Um, and that's how it exists today. And that's how it has existed for many, many years. We are proposing, uh, and I'll get into this in a moment, but we are proposing uh, putting a ready coffee location here. Um, and again, to do so, um, we need the, essentially the affirmative action of this board. Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. Anyway, yeah, that's a quick overview of, of Ready Coffee. And, you know, just sort of building on that, I wanted to, you know, I, I have reviewed, um, I've reviewed the, the town's comprehensive plan um, and I, and I want to look at that in the framework of what I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, that Ready Coffee has this track record of making nice places even better through infill development. Um, and, you know, I'll just say quickly that we, I think all the locations where we've developed so far, we have stimulated growth and set in motion positive community multiplier effects. Um, so, you know, I reviewed the, or we have reviewed the town comprehensive plan, the overarching plan priorities, um, the, the two, uh, the, the two uh, 
uh, most, in, in my opinion, important ones. One is improve resident quality of life um, through safety, connectedness, new services and amenities. And the second one that caught my attention was to strengthen civic life. Um, through the expansion of growing and healthy businesses, and in this case, through a better Main Street. Um, the, the town comprehensive plan calls for incentivizing infill development. This is infill development. The town comprehensive plan calls for development of underutilized spaces. This definitely qualifies. Um, the town comprehensive plan calls for expansion of commercial uses with an emphasis on experiential uses. I think our customers would agree uh, that Ready Coffee is an experiential use. Um, the, the plan emphasizes recreational restaurant and service uses, of which this definitely is one. In fact, it's, it's one that is beloved uh, by the community. Um, you know, in a post-COVID world of shrinking and struggling retail, lifestyle amenities like Ready Coffee are the most valued um, and relatedly the healthiest and most catalytic for a community. I know that the planning board sees retail uses all the time. In, in this day and age, uh, in the Amazon era, a lot of those are very iffy and um, lifestyle uses like ours, I believe, are the future. And I think your comprehensive plan accurately singles those out as the focus of development in these communities. Um, just a couple more quickly, the town comprehensive plan calls for development that takes advantage of existing infrastructure, including water, sewer, and roads, which this does. In fact, there is an existing curb cut on this property. That's the curb cut we intend to use. We don't intend to modify or change that curb cut. And we think it works well. It's not on Main Street, it's on Fairmont Taft. It's on the side street. Um, last and, and not least, uh, the town comprehensive plan calls for pedestrian friendly amenities. Um, and it's interesting, as I was reading through, it, it is a separate document, but it's your Main Street, the Main Street redevelopment say that you did in 2021. I couldn't help but notice that, the, that it had a pedestrian, um, uh, it, it did a survey of pedestrian and bicycle uses, and it singled out Dunkin' Donuts down the street as the primary driver of area pedestrian activity. I, I believe a ready coffee here would do multiples and promote multiples um, the pedestrian activity that that Dunkin' does, and, and I think it would be strongly driven by, by Vassar students. Um, you know, a quick word about other, I think, measurable positives. This ready coffee would, would bring 20 to 25 good paying jobs. Um, our barista jobs are perhaps the most sought after, highest paying hourly jobs in the region. I won't tell you what they make, but we pay our baristas very well. Um, in addition, we're a local business, so the profits that this store generates, as with our other stores, it comes right back into the community. So at our headquarters, we hire skilled employees, we hire white collar jobs. So we, you know, this just, this isn't, you know, a couple of fleeting construction jobs. This isn't some hourly uh, jobs. It, it, it's really the whole suite. Uh, and it uh, is the recycling of that money that can multiply in this community. Um, in addition, um, if you have been through Ready Coffee, and take a note of the great service that we provide. You know, that comes because we invest heavily in human capital of both our baristas and everyone in our company. It's really the foundation of what we do. Um, you know, as an example, if an hourly employee joining us will get, will begin to get life skills and leadership training from the day they join Ready Coffee. And so there's a, there's a large investment in human capital at Ready Coffee. Um, 
So this is good business too, and it's business that is beneficial to this community, the town of Poughkeepsie, and neighboring communities. So um, that's, that's my overview. Um, this proposal needs explicit support from this board, um, and, and we ask that, that you strongly consider putting your support behind this project. We believe it's supported by those with the most at stake. Um, council ward person Chershin supports it. Her constituents support it. To the best of our knowledge, Vassar College, who far and away is the largest employer and is uh, obviously has a great vested interest in the health of the community around them. We believe they support it. Um, and we, we ask that you strongly consider supporting this plan. Thank you. Can, can people walk up to it or do yes. you have to be in a car? Yeah, can you guys see the... Um, I see the drawing. You guys, do you, do you no, I see what, you show, what you're showing. Okay, so um, yes, so this is the, the sidewalk along Main and along Fairmont Taft. Mm -hmm. um, there will be two, uh, in our preliminary design, there'll be two patios. There'll be a patio at the service window and then a connected patio in back that will have a variety of seating and we do these, con if you've been to our LaGrange store, there's a concrete ottoman and there are these concrete sitting walls that people really like because they can be there with their friends as opposed to just being one or two people at a table. So there's a window for the cars and a window for people. There is a window Got for it. the cars, window for So you can't sit inside. You cannot go inside. So your entrance is on Fairmont, both in going in and out. That's the only way in. The Correct. That's where the curb. That is a very tight spot. Trying to get onto Route 55, coming off Main Street, mm -hmm. I don't see how that would that would not back up traffic. I really don't. Traffic's backed up now. I've I know. Traffic. You put that in there. I've seen your. I've. I don't shop in your store, but I've seen it over by Coles, and it, it is backed. And that's a big parking lot, and that backs up when you're trying to get in there. I can't see you getting in and out of here, especially with tractor trailers over there, all the car traffic running up to 55, going into the college, going into the apartment complex. I, I think that that's just, it's just that, that does you in right there, in my opinion, because you don't have, you, that's a horrible intersection to try to get in and out of, as it is now. And you're, you're a thriving business, and I'd love to have you. I, I would love to help you find another spot. I travel it quite a bit. It is really crowded. I always thought that was owned by Uno's. I was actually going to say something because it is so long kept. I thought Uno's used well, to have to park their overflow yeah, in there. I thought it was Uno's. It's owned by the, the a, a single party owns the parcel across the street and this parcel. Oh, okay. okay. And they were using it for parking for the restaurant, but the current restaurant in there doesn't want the parking. Oh, okay. So now it's, it's sitting totally empty and uh, unkempt. And I think really what needs to be done is a traffic study because I go through there all times a day and some days there's no, no cars there. It's very easy to slide through and other times during Trap. peak hours it tends to get more backed up. I mean I just like when I left the last tour meeting at night time it was busy. I mean and I had to wait on the other side of Main Street mm -hmm. because if a car is turning left mm -hmm. on a Taft and yeah. other cars you're waiting and waiting and you can't even come across to wait for that light. And you know the question I have is like how many cars would you be able to stack in there in the first place? So this is um this is 12 for 13 vehicles. Like waiting in line? Is that the yeah. parking or the wraparound building? <laughs> that is the, what we call the stack. The stack around the building. Yep. Yeah. Is it possible to open up the other, like by on Main Street and have an exit going out there? Nobody should handle them turning lanes. I don't know. I, I go to the dentist right next door there and coming in and out of his lot, and it's not busy, like there's not, it's not busy, is difficult. And that's like, I mean, you have, you have like a few patients kind of floating through over time. It's hard, it's hard at times to get in, just in and out of there. Um, and he's got two ways, two, oh, two ways in. Um, I mean, it, I've never had a ready coffee. I like your business though. I've driven, my wife does. I like, you put caffeine in me, it's not a great idea. So. But I like your business, and I've been impressed with it because I saw it go up, and I didn't really know what it was. And then as I've watched over nine, it is really busy, and you get a lot of 
or car traffic, but you get foot traffic. And I, I just, I think it's a great idea. Um, that lot is like, just like there's so many problems with a drive through there. You had touched on a whole bunch of things from the comprehensive plan and the Arlington Town Center as far as walkability, vast for kids and everything else. And I don't know, it seemed like your other locations weren't just like a photo mat drive through sort of booth. It was like more of a like standalone building. My only thought was to fit that there. If you took away the drive through maybe it fits there. Maybe then it does become that community gathering spot that you had said. Because otherwise, the drive through traffic, just it's going to be constantly jammed in. And that road, that section of road is so short that there's nowhere to queue it. But I like, like I, said, I think Councilman Sfron said, I'd like to find another place. I, if that were the spot without a drive-through, it, maybe it works a little bit better. But it's not profitable for you. I'm sorry. It's going to be profitable for you. The, if the core traffic is where you make your money. I don't think the concept would work. You know, we. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Are the all the other ones are like more of a drive-through than a? They all have drive-through. That's correct. Yeah. The other look. Lagrange yeah. has a sit-down, small seating okay. area. Correct. Co correct. Yeah. Lagrange yeah. does have a small seating area. Yeah. It just it's like a postage stamp sized lot, and that yeah. and it's just that that section of road is so short that That's like it. Amazing. Yeah, I don't even. I'm not even sure how you squeeze them in and out of there. But I mean, it, yeah, I I feel bad because I like the. I like the concept. No, it's a great operation. It's been extremely successful. But meeting with them early on, one of the comments I made was the three locations they have now, I don't know about Hyde Parks, they're all in a plaza where even though the footprint is only a very right. small footprint, mm -hmm. there's places to stack, places right. to park. If there's multiple you park, ways There's like five parking spots there. And <clears throat> I don't know how many employees you have. Where did they park? You know, did they end up taking up all your spots? I mean, it, I mean, <clears throat> We have worked this through, and uh, I respectfully am, am hearing your comments. I don't necessarily agree with those comments, but um, we have worked out how this would work, and we, we, we do not want, our customers have to remain happy, and happiness is based on the fluidity with which it all happens, mm -hmm. whether it be the customer service or the product or how they're circulating in and out of a site. Um, we do not want congestion. We don't want negative experience or frustrating experience for people. And we believe this site works very well. And I wouldn't, I would not be here if we didn't think oh. that it well. But, but um, that's our, that's I, our. Uh, I think it. sometimes it yeah. would probably work perfectly fine and other times it could be a complete disaster. And, and that's the problem is that I've, I, I've driven by the one in Wapager on Route 9 a million times, and it's busy, right. which is a good thing. But if this site is successful, then I think it doesn't work. If this site doesn't get as much traffic as the Wapager one, maybe it could work. On off hours, it probably works fine. A few cars go through, a few people park, some, some, some people walk up. But when it's busy, it just, like... I can't see anybody making a left-hand turn coming out of there. You'd have to make a right and then a quick left to get onto their trailer and go straight through. And that the light for the state it's highway, just it just wouldn't right. make it. You w I used to work over there. I went to work every day over there. I'd be through that intersection multiple times a day. Very tough. Very tough. I, your yeah. customers would not be happy. I think that's your only objection at this point. I mean, mm -hmm. people, I think the spot I is, is central. I love a local business versus, you know, the big box chains and... Um, the Vassar kids could walk there. I, I love seeing people on bikes and walking and using the community and connecting to the other parts of the, the ATC. Um, it's just that spot, you know, it seems brutal to come in and out of. And like Mike said, making a left-hand turn, I mean, it'll, it'll be, people will do it and then they'll get rear-ended and people will do it and then they'll get T-boned. I just picture all these accidents. So I, that, I feel, unfortunately, that's the only downside to this. I'd love to see. I'd love to help you find another location. Have you ever tried not using a drive-thru? Because the yes. Dunkin' Donuts down the street doesn't have a drive-thru. Uh, they, yeah, they, I think you're right. They don't. Um, have we ever tried using a drive-thru? We have not. 
That was. Yeah. It'd be better off to curb that's on Main Street, though. And, and here's the thing: now that I know you love her, get some coffee for me. But I mean, that would still be the same problems with the drive throughs yeah. People pulling yeah, in, yeah, pulling into park, going get the coffee. They're just getting they'll out. Have to leave. But you right. don't have the traffic wrapping around, constantly coming in and out is problematic. Without the drive through you get rid of some of that traffic. It, it is what it is. It's just tight, no matter what. I think can't you have another egress on Main Street? Like if there was a. You know, people are going to get frustrated. They're going to be waiting. They're going to be, there's, you know, anxious, and then they're going to make moves that are dangerous. There's that little driveway just on the opposite side of that property. There is. There is. If that if that was added in, it might give you a way to come in and come through. That's the drive-through for no, I know. Popeyes. No, I know. That's what I'm saying. Like that. Like I mean, that that's that, that's the only, I, that that piece is on a separate parcel. But that driveway would give you a different flow and pattern going in and out that one. That one curb cut is just hard to figure out how that works. You'd be better off if you wanted to do a traffic study where you have that car parked. Uh, I would go as close to the edge of the property as possible. Ask for a curb cut, see if you can get in that way and close the Fairmont section. You'd be better off coming in out of Main Street because they're only looking at two lanes of traffic at that point. And where is that tree line? You have another driveway. Yeah, two ways, two ways. Oh. Fairmont, so that sort of goes against our thought of not as many drivers as possible on Main Street trying to cut some of them off. I just think Fairmont's just a, a tough sell. It's a great product. For girl. It's just a tight, tight location. And if I'm not mistaken, even by the um, district I shot, it doesn't fit because it's not big enough. I'm not correct, Mike. It needs to be. Uh, that, that's what he was referring to. Yeah, before, yeah. yeah that's the, that's <clears> why I'm here. Yeah. There, there would need to be relief yeah. um, of that dimensional. Yeah. There is a building across the street that's got a yeah. parking lot that would be plenty for stacking ability and driving out. I I like the use. And even like the fact that it's a drive I don't really like drive throughs in all honesty, but the fact that your your location on Route Nine, people do stop and get out and, and I it like it's kind of a cool fit into the into the different locations sort of idea that's what i say i love the idea i thought it was a national chain when i saw it because it's really clever unique approach and doing something that like it gets people what they want in a like smart way but you, th this is uh, have you ever try i noticed at the beginning of your face um talking to next door or talking to a dentist to try to get a shared parking and maybe move your parking to try to make your lot bigger in a different context you do have more flow and more the lot next door I think it's a pizzeria bureau is tight also but mm -hmm. the dentist has space so to get extra space these are these are <coughs> things we could look into I don't personally control mm -hmm. either of the properties yes. we would lease this property um, from from the owner um, but it's, it's something we could look into you know, a couple of things that I'll that I'll leave you with. Um, one, there is a drive-through next door to this site. It's the Popeyes. To the best of my knowledge, um, no one has that has never that has not um, you know uh, gotten in the way of anyone's trip. Well, it's it's also like three lanes, so right? and they have an in and an out. Yeah, they have an in and out, three and lanes. It shoots out onto the arterial. Well, it like, also takes them twenty minutes for one of the signature sandwiches. But when they first open, they back up out. the arterial. Yeah, oh, they, right. yeah. It's just it takes too long to get a sandwich out of there. Exactly. So I, I would say that we serve in you know fifteen percent of the time. That, that yeah, that it's the delicious it's sandwich. It takes twenty minutes. Serve much faster. Um, I would also mention that. Our business has busy times of the day and yeah. times of the day that aren't busy at all. In fact, I would probably say it, a lot of the thoughts you're having or the comments you're, you're putting forward are true at extremes, but you know, 90 or 95% of the time isn't the case. Now, it is very possible, and it's our belief, that the times when we are very busy do not coincide. I mean, you know, there are traffic studies, state traffic studies. But if you got if you have five or six people that want to get a cup of coffee in there, they're going to be stuck on Main Street mm -hmm. to get in there. They're going to want coffee in the morning while they're going to work. That must be your busy time, right? Seven to nine? Uh, it's not. No. What is it? 10.30, 11, 11.30, and then 2, 2.30. <coughs> oh, interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, I personally don't think it's going to be a problem. Look, but you have to get into the nuance of how our yeah. flows work with the flows around it. Mm -hmm. It would be a problem, just not all the time. That's the thing. <laughs> And I'd be a fair much more of a problem than I mean, a 12-car stack is, is, is a long stack. Mm -hmm. and but you, what, I mean, but if you have 12-car stacked in there and somebody's trying to park or somebody, or like, faster students are walking up, you, like, it gets very, very jammed up quickly. And the problem, the problem really is there's not enough space on the property to queue everybody in there. And then that, that because that stretch of road is so small and there's nowhere to there's nowhere to go. Yeah, I'm less concerned about the stack. Because yeah, the, once they're in there, fine. They can wait all day for their coffee. Fair much more I'm more concerned about somebody coming in, somebody coming out, and then rushing to get out because they know that that light is short mm -hmm. as you head towards Vassar. I mean, if you've lived here, you know that light like the back of your hand. Mm -hmm. I know it. I know the timing. I know how quick I have. And then, <laughs> well, listen. And then, so people know that tiny, so they're going to rush. Yep. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Well, I'm just saying I know, like, my time to get through is very short. And so I, people will push the envelope. And then they'll get, we'll get phone calls on the board saying, who put that ready coffee in there? Yeah. There's accidents every other week. But I think we also need to address to having a left-hand turn there because I've been stuck like you have, too, with somebody wanting to make a left-hand turn and everybody heading north mm -hmm. clears first. And then they finally turn out. And one, maybe one other person gets out, and then you're done again. So, and that's part of the reason why Fairmont gets backed up is the light needs to be looked at. I just don't think you could add more traffic to Fairmont. But speak. Well, I think multiple people here. One of the questions they had was, should we let, you know, look at a traffic study? But it is, I just think it's a very tight spot to even think about that. Fair uh, amount here's is, the thing, it's an expense that I traffic think. study, like traffic study, I mean, you can find they somebody count a traffic study that'll say that it's doable. I mean, but it the doesn't, will, yeah, if the but it comes the back, board, they don't do anything for safety. Right, that's the thing, it's like, yeah, yeah, I don't, like, I don't really want to have them spend money wheels on something that's like, not going to do anything for safety, it's going right. to count cars. Because if, if someone, a traffic study, will, someone will come back and say, yeah, you can, it can flow. But if, like, he comes back and we look at it and we still say, no, it, it's just waste time wasted money. Right? The, like I said, well, the only thing I can think of is either no drive-through or that that Popeyes drive-through light somehow being an access point, and then giving you like more room to work and one way in, one way out, and that like it, that might make that might alleviate some of that stress. But that little that short piece of road that you're coming in and out of is the biggest problem because there's nowhere to queue from from there. And you do get jammed up there. Mm -hmm. the, the, the last thing uh, I will say, is, as long as I'm, I'm here, is that the way we release people, so once they are served at the window, the way we release them is very orderly. So we serve people in, let's say, about a minute. And so the release of the cars from that drive through window is very orderly. And in fact, if you look at, if you were to survey, 50 very high volume drive throughs in the Northeast, they often empty out into a very chaotic area. Like if you look at it, uh, if you look at Ransley Square, the, the Starbucks there, that that uh, drive through um, lane empties into a very congested, multi-lane, um, 50 to 100 parking spot with multiple tenant area. That's in Fishco, right? That's in Fishco. And there's a Panera there? There is a Panera. Yeah, uh, that's not a, that's not a yeah, great. That's it, it, it's not and, a great. And here's, here's but, the thing. But, I could give you like a thousand different locations where the planning failed. And oh, the, drive throughs the, drive through just the planning failed. Like the, the, the flow, you look at it, and the way the traffic flows through, you scratch your head and say, I don't, I'm not sure how they thought that was a good idea. This one on the front end looks problematic. At some point, I think somebody would go, geez, I don't know how that got through. Like I said, there's got to be some, like, there's got to be either a subtract or an add to make that a lot more viable. Otherwise, it just seems too tight. Anybody else? No. Thank you, Jack. Okay. Thank you. Next presentation is Cappy Duchess. What is it? Cappy Duchess.
Climate Smart Task Force, and with me tonight is Kristen Taylor, one of the senior planners in the planning department. So a partnership here between volunteers and staff, and we're here tonight because we want to bring the board up to date um, on the very important accomplishments that we are making in the Duchess Climate Action Planning Institute. Um, this is a project that has been planned at least since 2018 or 2019. There were endless delays and it finally was launched this past January. And we've reached a, a big milestone, which is completion of the town government operations greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Um, there are nine communities working in this uh, cohort with us, including the county itself. And I want to stress that the work we're doing is an inventory of greenhouse gas emissions from government operations. This is not a community inventory, but it is the town government. It is the buildings. It is the water stations. It is everything that the town owns and does, the fleet, all of it. Anything that produces emissions is what's included in this study. Um, based on the data that we've collected, there will be a climate action plan drafted to hopefully chart our course to bring those emissions down in, in future years. Uh, the cohort of nine communities meets monthly and it has been an incredibly supportive environment for the participating communities, um, helping each other, working together in parallel, each of us on our own inventories, uh, in addition to the people that are leading us through this, which is the Hudson Valley Regional Council. Um, so I also want to point out that the work that we're doing is going to bring us a very significant number of points towards our next level of climate smart certification. These are actions, uh, getting the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, developing a government operations climate action plan, and some other things we're going to do that are going to bring us very significant point totals towards the next part of, of climate smart. And just as a reminder, if you can put up the just as a reminder, I want you guys to, to feel good about the things that we've accomplished in the town and with Climate Smart over the past few years. We've had a lot of very major accomplishments. Um, we've been designated a clean energy community in 2021. We've achieved bronze Climate Smart uh, certification in 2021. We've adopted the comprehensive plan, which has sustainability elements. We've adopted the Natural Resources Inventory and Open Space Plan, and this is going to be the next big milestone for this work. So that being said, I want to turn the meeting over now to Kristen. She's going to talk to you more specifically about 
the inventory itself. She has been the lead person on the data collection and I have been sort of the lead person on the creation of the um, associated inventory report. So she's gonna go through that information with you to tell you what we learned about the camp. Thank you, Susan. And she's done an incredible job. I just wanna say she's done an incredible job. It's a lot of work. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you to Susan, um, our Climate Smart Task Force. Again, there are a group of volunteers um, helping us through this process. Um, so as Susan indicated, uh, we actually, um, everyone in the co cohort uh, worked with data from 2019. Um, this data was uh, primarily collected through a central Hudson data poll. Uh, we received a number, I, I forget if it was something on the order of 80 accounts or so from central Hudson. It was really fun to um, dissect, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, so we, we received the data poll. We had to kind of analyze, figure out which uh, accounts belong to which departments. I was able to create a master data list. Um, I actually have a science background, so I was like totally in my element. Um, and, you know, really was able to break down even by department um, what the, the usage is like for, um, you know, uh, in terms of energy or emissions usage by department. Um, and then we further were able to take that data and uh, and look at um, several factor sets is what they use the terminology they use so you can hear me say that uh, the factor sets include buildings and facilities street lights and traffic signals vehicle fleet employee commute water and wastewater treatment facilities um, and then there were several additional uh, factor sets that we could have provided data for but the town these are town owned i should also asterisk right very important these are town owned this is a government operations emissions inventory, so these are town owned and operated facilities. Um, we do not, the town of Poughkeepsie does not own and maintain or operate a transit fleet. We do not have a town owned um, uh, landfill um, or electric power production. So we focus on the items that have the check marks next to them. This is a pie chart. Uh, after we compiled all that data and, and got it all nice and organized and um, I uh, undoubtedly uh, was annoying to several of our department heads, um, but just remained persistent through that process. And I really do have to thank, um, you know, our water department, sewer department, and helping me to kind of identify and categorize a lot of that data um, and help us understand uh, what we were looking at. So once we were able to uh, organize all of that and get it into a clear the clear path tool which is the modeling forecast tool that we utilize through ICLEI. so we not only had to collect all the data analyze it group it we also had to learn how to use a modeling tool <laughs> so um, i spent a good amount of time learning how to do that through the ICLEI support um, and hudson valley regional council support um, it becomes pretty intuitive once you're in it so that was wonderful um, and ultimately this was the pie chart that we uh, ended up with based on the data and the inputs that we uh, collected. Um, that said, uh, the, they are organized uh, in my true fashion self. If you know me, I am incredibly um, anal about this kind of thing. Uh, so what you're seeing here is vehicle fleet being the greatest emitter um, and street lights being our lowest emitter. Um, uh, just um, as a sort of check on the data collection, obviously that makes a lot of sense. We are a pretty fairly large municipality. We have about 145 vehicles in our fleet. That includes town police vehicles. Um, and so this is demonstrating that our vehicle fleet um, is at 39.5% our highest emitter, essentially, of greenhouse gases. And that includes CO2, methane, nit um, nitrous oxide. Wow. Um, and, you know, so in any case, we're, we're basically um, working our way down in the percentages. Uh, wastewater, wastewater being next, buildings, facilities, employee commute, um, street lights. Um, as, again, as we kind of went through the data there, you know, we had, we had a learning curve. We had to understand what departments were emitting what. Um, and that said, there were instances where we had to make assumptions or if there was missing components or we didn't understand something, you know, we had to work with ICLEI and Hudson Valley Regional Council, contact our department heads um, and try to bridge the gap if there was any missing data. Um, it worked out that in um, 2019, the Climate Smart uh, Task Force actually conducted a, a full town-wide vehicle fleet inventory. Um, and those were the 145 vehicles I mentioned earlier. We have approximately 79 gas vehicles, 66 diesel vehicles. Um, and unfortunately at that time when that data was collected, 
we didn't, you know, we didn't actually pull out the amount of gas that was used or we purchased as a town. Mm -hmm. So we got a little bit creative. Um, you know, the, that information wasn't necessarily readily available from four years ago. So we contacted the comptroller's office, thanks to them, and figured out how much, uh, how many gallons of fuel uh, we used in 2019, and then further broke that down um, and applied the percentage of vehicle based on fuel use, and ultimately we're able to um, end up with the, the bar graph on the bottom right corner. Um, so it, it was it was about getting creative too with the data, um, and I do think that it's important to understand that the information we're providing here, although it might not be 100% accurate the pie chart is painting a much larger picture, which is what we're walking away with. And it's that, okay, we need to focus some attention on, maybe we need to right size our vehicle fleet a little bit, things of that nature. Uh, next, uh, we have water and wastewater facilities. Uh, I was able to work with our water treatment facility. I contacted Randy, um, was able to understand and learn how much the town was responsible, responsible for. Um, in terms of uh, usage in 2019, it turns out it was 52% of um, the whole use, the usage for 2019, um, and then that equated to 479 metric tons. Um, we also have a town-operated uh, wastewater treatment facility, again, uh, 219 metric tons. We have a number, many, many sewer pump stations. Again, this is a snapshot in time, so this number actually may have actually increased since 2019. <laughs> Um, and of course, water pump stations. And again, this was just about record keeping. I'm not gonna go through every bar graph. Uh, this has already been a long evening for you folks. Um, and then moving down the list of buildings and facilities, we're looking at about 360 metric tons. Uh, there was a lot of fact checking going on in terms of the police department, highway department, rec departments. Uh, you know, these are departments that are extremely active year round. Um, you know, we have, um, well, we're a population of 45,000. We have 31.2 square miles in the town. Uh, we're in charge of maintaining uh, approximately 100 miles of sewer and water infrastructure, uh, sewer infrastructure, 210 miles of water infrastructure, um, and approximately 148 miles of roadways within the town. So again, we're, we're a busy community. Um, these numbers make sense. It doesn't mean that we're doing anything wrong, but we probably could be doing maybe some things better. Um, and by gathering this data, it would allow us to look forward to potential funding opportunities, but you need to have the baseline and start somewhere and be educated before you just jump into an initiative. So that's what we were doing here. Um, another category was employee commute. Um, we had, uh, we came out at 319 metric tons. Um, this was uh, after, again, bothering our town department heads, uh, and I appreciated all their time and thanked them profusely. Uh, 16 town departments, um, 15 of, of those departments were less than 29 metric tons. Our police department did come out at 181 metric tons. Uh, this makes a lot of sense when you have approximately 200 employees and you're for the town, and about 102 of those are in our town police department. Okay, I'll make a note. <laughs> um, and so uh, during this... During this process, we actually uh, were able to collect a lot of data. I got about 85 responses out of all of the town employees, so I appreciate them being responsive. This factors in how many miles it takes for a person to get to and from, like get home from work. Uh, we thought that was a painted a complete picture. Um, we did try <laughs> to uh, collect data from the town uh, police department about employee commute, but rightfully so and fair enough. Um, that is a sensitive subject uh, for our officers and those uh, in the police department. So what we did was we got creative and took all of the, an average of all of the responses we had for everyone else in the town and applied it to the number of employees and we went from there. So again, this is just demonstrating and it's sort of like a fact check, right? So we know that we have about 115 employees in our police department. Of course, that's gonna be the greatest emitter. Um, and, and again, that's not that to say that they're doing anything wrong. It's just that, um, you know, we're like, oh, well, where maybe there's room for improvement. And maybe it's not even in the police department. It's in some of the other larger departments, building, water, sewer. Um, and uh, again, just looking to, to establish a baseline. Where are we? Last but not least, street lights. Uh, really not too much to report on this. I wish I had had more time to sort of delve into this a little bit more. 
book, we know that the town had moved to LEDs, and so we've been making strides. So it was great to see that, you know, that was sort of represented in the smallest percentage. Um, and also just, uh, well, that was it. Um, so for challenges, takeaways, and learnings, uh, I found myself personally um, sitting in the position of education. Uh, I had to uh, educate every department head that I spoke with. Um, we had, Susan and I, you know, we're pretty transparent in saying that we had maybe hoped for a little bit more time in this data collection process. It, this process keeps moving. This is only phase one. We're moving into phase two as of three weeks ago. Um, and so we wish we had had a little bit more time, a little bit more um, of a transparent approach uh, and ramp up to educating some of our department heads, um, you know, not necessarily staff, but department heads, um, and, and being able to just kind of just build that trust right from the start that, hey, we're not trying to, you know, point fingers at anybody, we're just data collecting at this point. Um, there was some, you know, it was, it became challenging again, we're looking four years ago, I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes I forget what I eat for breakfast by the time five o'clock rolls around. Um, but, you know, it was hard to, to, to piece together some of the data points, um, especially in clear path. It's forgiving in some ways and not in others. It's rigid and, hey, do you have this data point? If you don't, we can't report on X figure. So um, just being able to kind of track data at a, a more critical level, right? So, and as a town board, right, like we're always paying attention to a bottom line and budgets, you know, how much gas are we spending down in a department on gas? How many vehicles? What does that maintenance cost look like? Things like that. Not saying it's not being done, but maybe through a different lens such as this opens up more potential for funding opportunities or otherwise. Um, and so we, we had to make a lot of assumptions. I tried to set, shed some light on that. Estimations were required. Um, the time constraints kind of fed into the process overall, but um, we do have a path forward at this point, understanding the baseline and what those largest emitters were um, throughout this process. Um, and hopefully that sets the stage for what's coming. So, and just in case anybody's wondering why 2019 is the baseline year that's being used by everyone in the cohort, it was felt to be the most accurate recent year because of COVID and all of the work from home that went on. It was felt that use of buildings, facilities, commuting, and so forth would not have been typical. So everyone's doing 2019. Um, so we wanted to just close by showing you where we are in the CAPI process. So again, the inventory data collection has been done. The inventory report, which is a narrative illustrated version of what you see here tonight has been completed and will shortly be on the town website um, and I, I really hope everyone will take a look because we worked we worked very hard on it it's going to be available to the public we'll be glad to have feedback on that um, the next step in the CAPI project which again is a 16 or 18 month project and we are about nine months in so we're about halfway there is called emissions forecasting. So we're going to be taking what's going on in the town using this data and we're going to be forecasting using these tools what it's gonna look like if we stay with what they call business as usual, which means just doing what we're doing now, what is the graph of emissions going to look like over the coming years? And then we're going to be looking at some potential adjustments that we could make and what that's gonna to do to those curves. And that's gonna help us with some decision making about what we feel should be in the town's uh, recommended climate action plan. So those are the next steps that are coming up. The climate action plan is going to address what we call mitigation efforts, which means things the town can do directly to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce the amount of emissions causing climate change. We have also signed on with Supervisor Bailey's agreement to an additional piece for this project, which is called an adaptation plan. Adaptation is different, is that things that we can plan in the town to respond to the effects of climate change that are going to come, no matter what we do at this point, because they are at this point sort of baked into what's going on with, with the earth. So examples of that are sea level rise that we know is coming and what's gonna to happen to the waterfront. Another example would be the need for emergency planning for more heat and shade, you know, heat emergency uh, shelters and shade structures and things like that. So that's really what we call adaptation to what's coming. So we're gonna be doing work on all of these things. And then in addition, we have signed on to a separate 
much shorter project, which is going to be a parallel process, but much more limited to do the community emissions inventory and planning. And that's gonna be a four month project starting later this month. I and another volunteer from the Climate Smart Task Force are going to be taking that on. Um, there will be similar work, but a lot of the work has already been done for us. The whole community uh, data has been collected for all of the towns that are gonna be doing that. There's gonna be quite a few towns. So that's gonna be the next piece. And by early 2024, we should have a similar set of products um, for the community itself. And there will be also a significant number of climate smart points associated with all of that. Um, so we, again, we just, we wanted you guys to know where we were. This has been going on for several years now. We've done a lot of the work. We've reached this very important juncture. We are supposed to share this with you and the public. So that's what we're here to do tonight. And we thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of work. Thanks, Tristan. Thanks, Thanks Susan, work. and your team. Thank you. Absolutely. And again, just the final plug that all this information will be made available on the Climate Smart Task Force page, but there's also a separate CAPI page. So if you want to see any of that information or have questions, please feel free to reach out to Mike while they just getting no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next presentation by Ron Schulhoff. Is he here? I don't know. He might have failed. Oh. If he's not there, we can go on to the Camino Hall reports and see if he shows okay. up. Okay. Thank you. In that meantime, <laughs> if not, we'll just. Good morning to the next meeting. Finance committee? Uh, nothing reported. I think the supervisor is working on his budget, and the finance committee won't get up thereafter. Working on the budget, uh, special districts have been uh, presented to the town clerk, so we're making that progress. Technology? Yes, well, Google Analytics is up and running again, so we've got numbers for last month on the website. And we had 8,900 users to our website, and the top five pages were jobs, transfer station, receiver taxes, pay, and building. And then on our email delivery system, we picked up 57 new subscribers, and we have a total of 7,210 subscribers to our email list. And other t things that have been accomplished is uh, they're setting up the software licensing to test out the first mailbox um, migrations. So moving ahead with our new emails and um, mailboxes. And a laptop was purchased for planning and zoning. And the website has now got new pages on it for um, like Climate Smart and also the sewer departments and other departments. And yes, we've got access to Google Analytics now again. So the new Google, Google Analytics. And with our phone lines, Verizon has installed new circuits, so we'll be able to connect up to their uh, fiber service. And we're coordinating with Windstream, which provides our business um, phone lines, business phone. And we're coming up with the final um, leg of setting up with them. And that's it. Yes. OK. Uh, recreation. Okay, big list here. First of all, Janet stated uh, was went over all the parks that work is being done on, either completed or that started. It's a long list. They're still keeping up on everything. Um, there's a closing drive for Hope uh, on a mission still until September 18th. Donations can be dropped off at the Senior Center on Abe's Way, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 2.30. They're still looking for some more donations for that closing drive. Uh, good news, we received a, a grant from the Sloper grant for two new AEDs that will go to use hopefully in one of the parks that are out there, or well, obviously a couple of the parks out there. Uh, the camp is over, as everyone knows. It was a huge success this summer for all the camp sessions, which is good. The numbers were up over the last year. Uh, the only uh, downfall is the scholarship and financial assistance requests were higher than ever before. Uh, and the, the scholarship fund is, you know, depleted. So obviously, you know, the town's looking, the recreation area is looking for some sponsorship funding for those scholarships for financial assistance for camp next year. 
Uh, events coming up, the annual Halloween event is uh, Sunday, October 22nd at Crown Heights. Uh, you know, a trunk or treat, uh, chili cook off. That's one o'clock until 3.30. Uh, Peach Hill, the park, Apple Cider Fest, and Aqua Blitz, Saturday, September 30th, uh, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Hey, Jeff, just yeah. to interrupt you there, but uh, the uh, chili cook-off, do you want to tell them what our idea was for that? Oh, yeah, I don't know if you're going to get in there. You, you, well, you want to go ahead and make that? We're, we're going to challenge all the fire districts <laughs> to get in there, even the volunteer groups, make a big bucket of chili and come on and see who makes the best chili. There you go. See, see who takes that, right? So again, like so Peach Hill, like I mentioned, uh, obviously this Saturday, Arnton Street Fair, um, 12 o'clock to 6 p.m. in Raymond Avenue. And uh, last but not least, uh, the Habitat in Fairview on 9-11 uh, was a huge success. You know, uh, obviously, uh, Councilman Safone headed it up, and I'll turn it over to him to just give oh, an update of what well, happened that I, day. I, I certainly didn't head it up. It was uh, <laughs> Jay Baisley, Jen, and the recreation <laughs> staff. I was just a participant to help out. but. Uh, uh, it was a great success. Uh, we got to thank uh, Town of Kipsey PBA, uh, Lowe's Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Lowe's donated um, benches, uh, picnic tables, uh, Sherwin Williams paint, uh, and uh, we painted the dugouts and stain and everything. Um, the Habitat for Humanity did a great job. We had volunteers from IBM Poughkeepsie and Armonk. We had representatives from our senior center helping out, and we had the Habitat Angels. Uh, helping out with uh, just making sure we put the pavers down, uh, painted the decks, the dugouts look great. They painted them royal matte blue, which looks really nice, better than the park green. Um, and I couldn't ask for a better looking park right now, I gotta tell you. But uh, a really great job, and uh, uh, Town PBA did a great job. They took out uh, some bushes that uh, we had planted years ago that didn't let you see the memorial. And uh, they really, they really worked and cut the roots out. It was, I was watching them. It was painful watching them, but they did a great job and they had fun doing it. So, thanks to everybody. But um, you know, we're real happy to have humanity. They're, they're building some houses in our district, and uh, I'm looking forward to coming in. They're going to be giving some houses out to some veterans. So, uh, the Veterans Administration was there as well. So, it was really well received. We had about 50 people uh, working hard all day, and uh, we have a few little projects to clean up and. Uh, Mike Simon's going to help us with that. So thank you, Mike, and uh, it was a great time. And as you said, Mike, um, when Habitat came, we didn't know what they were looking for. They were in the process of doing a project for five homes on Somerset, which um, we connected them with a gentleman who was trying to get rid of that property years ago. So they've been working with the planning board over the last year with that. So we thought this would be great because this is the park that those residents would be using once the homes were built. So we thought of being close, being a war memorial, being 9-11, we thought Fairview was the best location to do that. It was a great turnout for the day. And they actually had a young lady come and sing who was at 9-11 and was at the police command post um, working as a social worker who was put on the spot to be on the scene, becoming an emergency responder that day. So it was an emotional day on top of a great day to see a lot done and a lot of community efforts brought forward by the town residents. I could just add, you guys did a great job putting that together. It was nice that with a 9-11 memorial ceremony, it was coupled with a positive work day where things got done and people came together. So it was, it was kind of a cool thing to see. Anything else for recreation, Jeff? That's it. Fire advisory. No report. Infrastructure. No report. Personnel. Uh, it's probably a no, sir. No. Okay. no, nothing to report. Yeah. <clears throat> Building consolidation. Um, looks like the working group is just about finished with their work. I've written to one of the members of the working group to give us a day to give us a presentation. So we're working on a date for that presentation. And once we get that date, we'll uh, let you know and we'll be presenting to the board what their determinations were. And the supervisor's report, um, as we said, the special district's budget is done. They've been turned over to the Town Clerk, the notices have, I think have been sent out already, Felicia, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's in process. Yeah, the notices I probably are won't be here when it goes out. Right. The notices are out to all the residents. Um, we've been working on the budget. It's, as we said, it was extremely tight. We thought this would be a, a better, easier year. But then we see the rate of inflation on top of insurance companies looking for a huge increase. The retirement numbers went through the roof. It was... Um, extremely time consuming, difficult. We are not done yet. We're still meeting with some of the department heads to try to get some numbers to bring it down 
a little further, but you look at what some of the other numbers coming in from the library were, were extremely high. So we're still doing our best to do what we can for the residents and get that number, our number down as low as possible. That's all I have. Um, yep. Yeah, we're not going to leave them hanging. Ron, are you ready to present? If yes. We're still there. He's there. Tim, can we let him in? Can share? we unmute Ron? Ron Shaw. Yep. Composting. Ron, can you unmute yourself? Yes. There you go. Thank Hello. you. Hi, Ron. I can't start my video. It won't let me start my video, but hopefully you can hear me. I do hear you. We do hear you. Okay, great. Well, hello, everyone. Um, is there a screen that you'll be able to see if I present? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Um, well, hello, everyone. My name is Ron Shulha. Um, I am a resident down here in Westchester in Scarsdale. And myself and another resident, Michelle Sterling, uh, she just couldn't join us tonight have chaired our town sustainability committee, uh, which partnered with our village about seven years ago to start the first municipal food scrap recycling program in Westchester. Ron, are you um, sharing? Um, are you sharing your screen? I'm going to share it in a second. Okay, fine. You know what? I, I can share it now since you can't actually see me. Usually I just talk for a minute about who we are, but I'll share it now. Thank okay. you. We see it. Hopefully you all see that. Thanks for sharing. I'm so Michelle and I started this municipal program. Um, it is run by the municipality by our Department of Public Works, but it's a partnership with our um, sustainability committee. And since that time, um, in addition to doing it here in Scarsdale and growing the program here in our own community, we've helped about 50 other municipalities, five zero around Westchester, uh, Rockland, Putnam, Orange, uh, all around New York State, Connecticut, Long Island, um, places that are similar to Scarsdale in size, some places that are larger, uh, rural, urban, places that are affluent, places that are less affluent. Um, so we can talk about examples of all kinds of different communities. But what I wanted to do tonight was just really explain how this program works so you can understand how you could bring it to your residents. So there's a few pieces. I'm going to go uh, through the slides in a second. There's really a few pieces I want to tell you about. The first is how this works for your residents. The second piece is how it works for your staff and operationally. Third, what the finances look like. And then lastly, how we've gotten to a place where here in Scarsdale, we're recycling literally tons of food scraps every week and have a couple thousand households participating in this voluntary program. So I'll go through. Um, if people have questions as we go, I'm happy to take them. I'll probably cover a lot of stuff. So if you want to wait till the end, and then you can ask me any follow up uh, or any in additional information. So I'm going to talk a lot about food scrap recycling. You're not going to hear me talk about composting tonight. Sometimes you hear this program referred to as composting. And the reason that we talk about food scrap recycling is we've really developed this program to be just like any other municipal recycling program, whether you're recycling paper, bottles and cans, what have you. For a resident, we just want to make it really easy. They don't have to know where it goes. They don't even have to know why it's necessarily beneficial, although we tell them that. But we just want them to have a very streamlined, simple experience. So how does that work from the resident side? So residents are able to buy this starter kit that you see in this picture. The small uh, beige bin is your countertop pail. So this goes in your kitchen. Um, it holds about, well, it's, it sits nicely on your kitchen, so it's not too obtrusive. Um, and this is where you're gonna put all your food scraps. To make it really neat and clean, you can line it with a compostable bag, so that little green roll of bags in the middle. Looks like plastic, it feels like plastic, it works like plastic, but it's actually made of corn and it's fully compostable. So you line your pail and you put your food in it when you're done. And the beauty of this program is that it's all food. So it's fruit and vegetables. So if anybody um, in the audience or on the board happens to backyard compost at home, which is awesome and we fully support it and I do it, you know you can put really just fruit and vegetables in the backyard bin. In this program, it's anything. So it's fruit and vegetables, 
You could put in meat and fish. The bones can go in. Bread, rice, pasta, cooked food, uncooked food, food that your kids threw on the floor, expired food. The shells of nuts can go in here. Any food. So when you or someone in your family is done, you don't have to think about what's on your plate. Hopefully you finished all your food. But if there's any scraps or you're preparing and you're cooking, you just put it all into this countertop pail. You can also put in soft paper, which is not recyclable. So paper towels, napkins, and tissues, as long as you don't spray any cleaner on it. You can put in popsicle sticks or chopsticks because they're made out of wood and bamboo and even cut flowers can go in here. So throughout the week, you put all your food in your pail. Uh, the lid seals shut and there's tiny little holes that let the moisture escape, but there's no bugs, there's no smell. We've been doing this in our town with thousands of homes for seven years now. and People have a fantastic experience. Um, this countertop pail is going to fill up depending on how many people in your home, how much you cook, anywhere from every day to every few days. So when that fills up, you have a larger green bin. We call that the storage and transportation container. Uh, it can hold about four or five of the bags from the little container. Most people keep it in a garage. Some people keep it in a mudroom or under their sink. Uh, we don't recommend people keep it outside, but if you look at the yellow latch on the top, you'll see a little tab sort of underneath it. That is an animal lock. Um, so we know some people do keep it outside, so it is animal proof, although we don't recommend doing that. So you collect each week your food scraps, and we recommend people go once a week to someone collecting, once a week to our drop-off site. So here in Scarsdale, we do have a, tra um, a transfer station where there's lots of other recycling items. Some towns don't have that, that's okay. You can put it in a village hall parking lot, some places have put it in a park. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how the setup looks in a second, but a resident comes up to these bins, takes the large green bin, and just dumps all those bags of food scraps into these bright green toters. And that's it for the resident side. And so what's really key here is it's just like any other waste disposal. It's super easy, it's clean, and from the resident perspective, they're done. They've driven away. They don't have to worry about any other part of it. I'm gonna go to um, what is uh, the operational side for the municipality, but um, I can't see you by the way, because I just see my own slides. So if anybody has any questions, please just interrupt. So what does our drop off site look like? So here you can see it takes up about the space of two parking spots. We didn't do anything fancy to set it up. We put a big sign in the back um, that's about five feet wide that has all the accepted items that you can put on there. By the way, all those items are also on this green sticker. You can't see, but the lid of this larger green bin is hot stamped with that. Um, and it's in this guide that comes with the, um, the starter kit as well. So these, uh, you have a sign here. And then we have special organics toters. So what makes them organics toters? So first, they have a much uh, thicker plastic than a typical toter. By the way, these are from the brand Toter. Uh, you've probably seen them. They sell them at Home Depot. A lot of municipalities and sanitation companies use them. Um, it looks like their regular bin, but they are a little different. So they have a thicker plastic that is heavier duty. There is a latch on the lid to keep it closed. It is fully sealed. What that means is there's no place for any um, um, odor or any liquid to get out of the bin. So once they are closed, they're fully sealed. And of course, they're a bright green color so that it's clear that this is for food, not for trash or recycling. So how does this work operationally for our staff or your staff? What we do is we have a staff member. There's nobody that was hired to run this program. We have a transfer station where there's somebody that works. If it was in a village hall parking lot, somebody would just need to be able to go by every couple, ideally every day. If they can't do it every day, that's okay too. So what are they doing with it? There's nobody that stays here all the time, whether volunteer or a paid staff member. Uh, this site is not managed in that way. So what are they gonna do? Well, we have a bunch of empty bins on one side and we wheel up somewhere between three to five um, per day. And you'll get a sense of how many. You really want to wheel up about the number that will fill up in a day or two days. And why is that? 
Imagine if you had all 10 or 20 bins lined up in front and somebody comes up with the little food scraps in the left one that somebody puts in the middle and then somebody in the right and then somebody comes six days later and then is opening that bin up. You know, that's, it is food. It is in a compostable bag, but it is food. And we want people to have a good experience, a clean experience. So what happens is we leave a few up at a time, those get filled up, then they get turned around and moved to the other side and they're not touched until pickup day by the hauler. So we usually love to give our tours in the summer. We'll give them all year, but we give people tours all the time and our favorite time is to do it in July and August because it's hot, it's humid, we're there giving a tour and there's no smell. These are the same bins we've had since the beginning. There's no chew holes in them. There's no animals getting at them because they're fully sealed. Um, no odor is getting out. You wouldn't even know it was in. So from a staffing perspective, you really just want somebody that can go there ideally at the end of each day, check the bins, are they full? Okay, they're full, I wheel it to the side. On the pickup day, so we get them picked up once a week by a hauler. The hauler as part of their contract, and you can share the RFP that we used with you, um, they're in charge of dumping them, making sure that they're fully empty, and then putting them back. So there's nothing that our staff does on the pickup day. Um, you'll notice in the three bins in the front, you can see that there's a, a large compostable bag kind of pulled over the front. So we do line these large toters with big compostable bags, and we do that just to help the bins stay really neat and clean, um, especially if somebody drops off food scraps that's loose, that's not in a compostable bag. So um, in the summer months, we do recommend that they get washed out ideally every couple weeks. It could be every month, that'd be okay. Or even if just the staff member looks and says, okay, this bin needs to get rinsed out now. Um, the rest of the year, especially in winter and in fall and early spring, you don't really need to rinse them because they're lined. Um, they're not really gonna get dirty. If they happen to get dirty, it is good to rinse them so both your staff and your, re your residents can have a good experience. So from the operational side, we wanted to keep it very simple for our staff. So like I said, we didn't hire anybody new. Nobody is here all day when it's open. Uh, they just come at the end of the day to check the bins. I'm gonna jump ahead to what the financials look like. So there's three main costs of this program. Uh, when we were starting it here in Scarsdale, what our board asked us was to really understand, is this something that has a, two questions, a large upfront capital cost and what does the recurring operating costs look like? And what would that look like in the future? So, you know, we were the first, everybody said, will this work? Of course, we know it works now. We've helped 50 other towns do it. Our residents love it. It's hugely successful. But in the beginning, um, we wanted to make sure that we didn't have a large capital, oops, sorry, a large capital cost. So what you saw in that picture, this is it. It's a sign and we recommend buying 20 bins. The sign's about $400. Um, the bins are about $125. If you put it in one site and then you decide there's a better site later, you just can move it. The second piece is your annual expenses, your operating costs. The main cost for that is gonna be your weekly pickup and hauling that you're paying a private carter to come pick it up and transfer it to a compost facility. So to be clear, we do not compost any food scraps here in Scarsdale. They are picked up and brought to a commercial facility that can handle the large scale. Um, it has the economies of scale because they take from all these municipalities. Uh, the cost is about $500 a month um, or $6,000 a year. The other costs are the compostable liners for those large toters. And then some, we allocate some small amount for outreach and publicity. So we have some banners we put up in town, but the main one is a big event we do each year called Compost Give Back Day, which I'll tell you about in one second. The third piece, um, it's actually the number that is often the highest, but it's not really an expense. It's the initial outlay the municipality will put out for those starter kits. So it's really important that the municipality buys those starter kits that residents can then buy from you. And there's two reasons for that. The first is you get a much better price. Uh, you'll get the same price that we all get because 
we can, we can all piggyback on each other. Um, and they're shipping them to you in a large pallet, not individually boxed. So I should have mentioned before, this starter kit costs a resident $20 for the two bins, the roll of compostable bags. Um, that is the cost to the village. We don't make, the village doesn't make any money on it. Uh, we will be just doing this as a service. If you were to go online to try to buy them, this whole thing would be about $50. The other reason um, that is really important to offer it is that Michelle and I have tested every bit on the market. We don't work for any company. We don't have any vested interest except getting you the best one that's out there. Uh, we've tested it with residents. We know what the best bags are. And if you send somebody online and they buy something they have a bad experience with it, they're just gonna get frustrated. Now, if somebody wants to buy a nicer one or they don't wanna buy any kit, that's okay too. You don't have to buy the kit, but I'm gonna say 99% of people do. You don't have to use compostable bags, but 99% of people want to because it makes it clean and easy. So the municipality, um, we put in here a number of 600, thinking about your population, we can talk about exact numbers, but the idea is you would buy those up front. Um, you would also buy extra compostable bags. Um, so that way residents could just buy the bags from you. An important part is, you want the residents to get them cheaper and you want them to make sure they're using compostable, not a uh, green plastic. So we don't want the, any contaminating it. So just a couple, uh, two more quick pieces. I just wanna show you what the purpose of all of this is. So this is what we're making, not us, but the facility that makes it. This, all of our food scraps are turning into potting soil and compost. Uh, the same potting soil and compost and topsoil that you would buy at a garden center or a landscaper would buy or a farmer would use. So on the right, you can see that's what a pile looks like when the food scraps are first bought, you brought over, you can see the bags over there. And in just three months, the pile on the left, you have finished compost at the compost facility. And of course, we want our residents to know about this as well. So we, a huge outreach we do is once a year, we do a compost give back day. Uh, it's open to anybody, whether you participate or not. And we, our DPW, our public works department, sends our two, we used to send our one largest truck, now we send two trucks to pick up compost and residents can come pick it up, um, you know, a, a, mini, a reasonable amount, they can't fill up their truck with it, but enough to use at home to see what it's about. And there's Michelle and I and other volunteers doing outreach, signing more people up for the program. And this is a really important point, um, this is, uh, the last piece I'm gonna leave you with and then I'll answer any questions. It's not just enough to ask your village, um, your municipal staff to just start a program. To make this a successful program, you need to engage your volunteers as well to do the outreach. It's really not reasonable to ask our professional staff to be doing outreach on top of everything else they do. Of course, they're gonna put out a press release. They might put up a banner and all that stuff is really important. But the way you're going to get people signed up for this program is having volunteers and it doesn't, you don't need a giant committee. Um, it's also just not Michelle and I doing it, but Michelle and I organize a lot. And then we have a lot of people that do the program that say, how can I help spread the word? And sometimes they'll just come and help out an event for a couple hours. And it's just going places where there are people. It doesn't need to be an environmental event. So it could be going to a school. It could be going to a farmer's market or an outdoor concert. We, Michelle and I went to all of our houses of worship and talked to the clergy there and said, could we make an announcement? And what was really nice is um, the clergy found a time where they were able to um, tie into one of their sermons. So we could talk about you know, what we need to do. And then Michelle and I were able to come in and say, and you can do it. Here's an example of something you can go do. So this is how we've grown our program um, to about a third of our town doing this voluntarily. We get new sign, we've been doing this for years. We get new signups every week still, whether it's from friends telling other friends, from other outreach or just people seeing the banner or going to the drop-off site. Um, it's just a wonderful program that our residents love because it's a way that our village gave them an ability to do something that they really wouldn't otherwise been able to do. And for our village felt great about it because it was a cost-effective way to start a program that's open to everybody 
Um, and, you know, normally when we give a tour, our head of public works is there and you can, he will tell you a lot of the calls they get on an average day maybe aren't the nicest calls about trash pickup or recycling pickup, but they always get really positive feedback about this program. The residents, our residents just love that they're able to do this. And so of course, the whole reason we're doing it is we're just trying to close the loop. Food scraps are a resource. You know, that apple core that we don't eat still has energy and nutrients in it, but landfilling it or incinerating it doesn't get that back, but composting does. Um, and it's not necessarily something that everybody can do themselves <coughs> at home, but it is a program that we can help them do through the municipality. So I'm going to pause there. I know I just gave you a lot. Oh, I can't see. I start my video. Oh, there I am. Um, if people have questions or they'd like some other information. Um, Ron, one question somebody did have in the audience was, do they, does Scarsdale also have, um, the village picks up the trash on a daily ba a regular basis in Scarsdale or is it outside Carter's? That's a great question. So here in Scarsdale and most of Westchester, we do have a municipal fleet. So Scarsdale and about 30 or four, 30 of the 40 Westchester towns, we own our trucks. It's village staff that picks up garbage and recycling. That is not the case. Um, in all places, and it's definitely not the case in uh, places a little farther north from us and in Connecticut, uh, they don't, they outsource it to private haulers. Um, and then, the, but the municipality runs the drop-off site. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any other questions this time? Um, no, but I just wanted to, to say a couple things. Um, so, uh, being part of the CAC, I got involved in this um, a little bit, and I didn't know much about composting, food scrap recycling at all. So I learned a lot um, about it, and um, I had Johanna Fallhurt, who's on the CAC with me, very passionate about it. Yes, she's here. Um, and so, you know, I learned a lot, and the, the fact is, is that a lot of residents, this is important to them, and this is something that they want to do. Um, even though it's not on everyone's radar, it certainly wasn't my, on my radar per se. Um, you know, there's the environmental piece, of course, and then the, the whole nature cycle, which I, I, I'm fond of. <laughs> um, but there are constituents that are going to want to do this. And, um, you know, I, I was very hung up on the fact that, well, well people aren't just going to drive it there, are they? I mean, we should pick it up. But Ron insisted that don't even think about pickup or anything like that because there are services in the area. There's a woman in Kings, uh, Rhinebeck that picks up and she has a little mini bus and this is her full-time gig um, that don't even talk about picking up right now. It is a service that we would offer after people buy the bin and then people will bring it to a central location, which is why I wanted Mike Simon here, head of the highway department. Um, it would be minimal um, you know, involvement from his team and I, and I wanna make that as minimal as possible. And, and Ron did talk about just kind of moving those cans back moving them over and that would be kind of the minimal impact on our people because I don't want anyone working, they're already stretched thin. Um, so um, that being said, there are people that would be interested in this and getting it picked up at their houses is something that's way off. If this is successful, then we could go that route at some point, but for right now, up front, it's more about providing the service to the people that are gonna be interested in it and raising awareness on food scrap recycling. So I appreciate your time, Ron. Yeah. I would just add if um, if Mike wants, I think it was Mike, um, yes. wants to reach out to our head of public works, I'm happy to make that connection. He, he usually when we give tours, we often, ha we give tours all the time, especially places that are a little closer. And when uh, any municipal staff member comes, Jeff or Coleman, our head of DPW, also will be there. So that way they can talk directly about the operational aspects. So I'm happy, if there's any questions, I I'm happy to answer them. But um, I know sometimes they'd rather talk to the municipal staff member to really understand um, their perspective. And then the last thing I'll say is um, the uh, Ron has made this blueprint. Ron and Michelle have made this blueprint, which has been successful in a lot of other municipalities. So we are not reinventing the wheel. The work is done. It is. He obviously has all the costs laid out. He has some haulers he can recommend. Um, so in terms of ramping up, the ramping up has been done for us. Um, it's just more of implementation. 
Um, so I don't want us to fear this. I want us to, you know, welcome Great. it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. A great thanks for all the time that you and Johanna did visiting not just Scarsdale but other locations mm -hmm. to see what they offer and the fact to see that Ron had it and had everything that he would be willing to offer does his whole plan which I think is great mm -hmm. because we're not starting from scratch making 50 mistakes first we have a plan that works and I just getting the version eight and I just want to say Ron thank thank you for making a difference in the world around you because a lot of people don't bother to, they, they may compost in their own backyard, but you took it to a whole different level. So it's impressive with the fact that you figured out how to fine tune it to make it user friendly enough for people to actually participate, so. Well, we appreciate that. And our, our residents really, um, our residents really appreciate it. One of the nice things about when we give a tour is often you'll see residents coming by, dropping off um, and they'll talk about it. and. You know, some of them will talk about how when they first started, they didn't even know what compost was. You know, the yet the first people that signed up, they knew what composting was and they were they were waiting for it. But we've gotten so many people now that their kids come home from school, um, or we have uh, our, a lot of our seniors that say, you know, this is how I lived my life when I was younger, and we got so far away from it. So people have just really embraced it from all walks of life. It's been really nice. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Have a great night. You too. Thank you. I'd like to make the motions and the rules for any item. Second. Close the hearing. Aye. Anybody like to speak? Um, this is the time we ask you to please keep it to three minutes. Doreen. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to talk about the composting. And this is a, sounds like a great program. but. I just want to point out to people that even if the town is not able to take this up right away, um, you can do this on your own. We have one of those little compost bins on our um, counter. And then we have a composter. We've been doing this for about 25 years now out in our um, backyard. So if you have a space to, to do this, um, you know, and then you end up with compost, which we use, we have a lot of um, flower beds in our yard and um, we use the compost for that and and basically it's a win-win uh, situation and and one thing maybe the town could do ahead of time is um just buy some of these items in bulk because um you know the, the compost bins can be quite um costly and if you can buy them in bulk for um less of a price and then have them um available to town residents that would be good i know the County, I think, had a, a program to buy a composter, but they they were pretty expensive from what I remember. It could actually be, I'm, I'm not certain, but it could be at least um, $50 to buy one from them now. So anything the town can do uh, would be helpful, but people can do this on their own without a lot of um, fancy equipment. So I would just uh, support anybody composting either on their own or um, as part of the town. Well, we'll be looking for volunteers, Doreen, once we get up and going for events. And like, for instance, I mean, this Arlington Street Fair would be perfect. Um, so I'll, I'll call you up. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Doreen. Johanna. Hi, I'm Johanna Fallard. I live in the town. And Ann Berger and I have been working on this uh, to present to the board. Uh, and in response to Doreen, the beauty of this program is that for those people who cannot compost in their backyard. They have an opportunity to bring their food scraps beyond what you can actually compost in your backyard, including meat and bones and all that. Also, this fits in beautifully, this program with the CAPI inventory, because it reduces the greenhouse gas emissions from when you burn organic matter at the incinerator, right? If you're turning it into compost and not sending food scraps, which are now in the solid waste main, you know, stream, uh, will benefit from that, will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And it's a one-stop shopping program. He has researched the type of bins, the types of toters, and so on. Uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, uh, and we'll get reimbursement from the state. Mm -hmm. there's, so grants there's a lot of good benefits to it. And we've had a long meeting. I thank you all for attention. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you. Is there anybody else? If not Motion to resume the rules. Second. Second. Rules in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Renahan. 
Be resolved that the Town Board of Town of Poughkeepsie is hereby adjourned to executive session instead of the following. Discussions regarding proposed pending or current litigation, New York State Department of Labor. The proposed acquisition, sale, or lease of real property when publicly would substantially affect the value thereof. To discuss matters which are exempt under open meeting law, including matters subject to attorney client privilege. And be a further resolved that no action appropriating money will be taken in executive session. So moved. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Town board goes in executive session at 9 10 p.m. Thank you, everybody.